a few weeks ago on stream, someone linked me this article right here, and I actually read through all of the article on the stream, so I'm not going to be doing so again today, but if you want to go and actually see me read through all of this, I guess I'll leave a link to it in the description down below, and there'll be a link up there as well. It should be timestamped to where the reading actually starts. I don't read it very concisely, it is on a stream, so expect it to take far longer than it actually should. So what I'm going to be doing today is taking some of the interesting points being made in this article, and sort of use it as a stepping stone to extend the discussion. Because me and the author sort of fundamentally disagree on why you should be using Vim. The first point being made is about the potential productivity increase that can come from using Vim. So the author says, the problem is that many Vim users swear to the increased productivity that Vim provides, yet few Vim users actually realize they are not really using Vim. Instead, they have stuffed Vim full of plugins and a thousand line long VimRC file that completely change how Vim normally works. Now, I've talked about how I feel about Vim plugins in the past, and I've done whole series on Vim plugins, so it's pretty obvious where I actually stand on Vim plugins. I don't think that you have to use Vim in a specific way, whether that be, you know, vanilla Vim, or maybe you're someone who likes something like Space Vim. I don't think there's any correct way to actually use Vim. So regardless of how you're actually using it, you're still really using Vim. I've never really understood this argument some people make. It's still using Vim nonetheless, even if it's not your favorite way of using it. Because the way I look at Vim is Vim isn't just a text editor, it's a text editor platform, and you can use it to build the exact text editor that you want to actually use. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. Bram Molinar, the developer of Vim, has said in multiple keynotes and interviews that the Vim plugin system turns it into a platform. And if you ask him about Vim plugins, he'll talk about them in a positive way, especially when it comes to things like, say, how NeoVim has extra features that base Vim doesn't actually has. And he'll usually say something like, that feature doesn't really make any sense to be in the base version of Vim. It makes more sense existing as a plugin because that will be much easier to maintain. Imagine looking at other things like this, like let's say your Linux distribution. So I'm running Arch Linux and when you first install Arch Linux, basically you're just dropped into a TTY. You have the GNU applications installed. You have a couple of extra things installed and that's about it. Imagine if someone said to you that unless you run Arch Linux like it comes from the ISO, you're not actually running Arch Linux. That doesn't make any sense as a statement and doesn't make any sense when we're talking about Vim either. Now with the next point, I actually do kind of agree. So he says many Vim users also repeatedly state that Vim is only hard to use at first, but when you really learn it, you become very productive. Now in his case, he's meaning really learn as in really learning vanilla Vim. In my case, I mean learning your own workflow that you want to work with. The problem with that statement for me was that I found myself just as productive whenever I used a simple text editor and grep, orc, and sed alongside it. When you first start with Vim, especially if you've never tried anything modal, it does feel like a very different way of working, and I guess you would kind of call that hard to get used to, because if you've been used to working with things like Eclipse, Visual Studio, VS Code, Sublime, while the text writing is the same, the way you actually interact with the text editor is fundamentally different. And I've had people on Discord who are getting, basically just getting into programming, ask me if they should learn how to use Vim alongside learning the program. And I always say that you probably shouldn't do that. If you want to learn Vim, you can always come back and learn Vim later on. But for now, just focus on learning how to program and getting good at that. Because Vim is a skill you can pick up really at any point. And if you are using something like VS Code, but still want a lot of the same sort of regex functionality, a lot of it can actually be repeated with things like grep, orc, and sed. It might be slightly less convenient, but when you're bad at Vim anyway, it's going to be basically the same. And if you are using something like VS Code, you have that integrated terminal there, so you can actually just run commands as if you have a command mode inside of VS Code. And I fully understand there are people who just never have any interest in learning Vim, and if they do want to use that same sort of functionality, they're more than happy to use VS Code alongside those standard Unix utilities. That's perfectly fine. I'm in no place to tell you what text editor you have to use. 
Next up, he says, if you really learn Sublime Text, you'll become super productive. If you really learn Emacs, you'll become super productive. If you really learn Visual Studio, you get the idea. Here's the thing though, you never actually really need to learn your text editor unless you use Vim. Before we get into my main argument, I have a big problem with one part of this. So why is Emacs on that list if that's the argument you're trying to make? Because Emacs sort of has the same sort of difficulty curve that Vim does and is actually very difficult to use when you first start using it. So having Emacs on that list makes no sense. But my other argument here is that even with things like, say, Visual Studio, Eclipse, Visual Studio Code, Sublime, anything like that, sure, you can start writing in it straight away with, you know, basically no effort. But actually knowing how to use the extra features that come along with it do actually take a lot of effort using things like the debugger, for example. The debugger isn't a simple thing to understand. Or the integrated build systems and package managers and, God forbid, the UI and things like Eclipse and Visual Studio are things of nightmares. I absolutely hate them. And that's without even getting into things like, say, all of the hotkeys you can learn to actually simplify your process of actually using the application. Sure, the initial setup for Vim does take a bit extra time to get used to, but in reality, you don't even need to know Vim keys to actually start moving around because in a lot of cases, your terminal will have mouse support and if you're using something like GVim, it's going to have mouse support anyway. All you really need to know with Vim to get started with it is press I to type, press escape to stop type, and then colon WQ to save. And that's literally all you need to know to get started with Vim. Sure, there might be hundreds or thousands of hours of other stuff you can go and learn, but in reality, to get started with Vim doesn't take that much effort, and then to actually be productive in the application, while it might be a different workflow from what you're used to, doesn't take too much effort to really get comfortable with. Next up he says, I also know people who didn't know basic stuff you can do with Vim even after having used the editor for many years. In 10 years you can master multiple programming languages yet still find yourself discovering things about Vim you didn't know was possible or even existed. Now, the example of a programming language is actually a really bad one here and I'm going to fully abuse it. So. Even if you spend 10 years on something like C, you're not going to know every single library out there. If you spend 10 years on JavaScript, you won't know every single library out there, especially something like JavaScript, actually, because JavaScript is a very frequently changing language. Sure, you will know most of what you need to know, and when something new comes into your vision, you'll probably be able to understand it fairly quickly, but the exact same is true for Vim as well. Once you understand the basics of how things actually work in Vim, you can sort of apply that knowledge to new things you come across. I think this is one of the great things about Vim, that when you're using this editor, you can get a lot of work done just knowing a fairly small part of it, and then if you are the sort of person who does want to go and dig into things like how far can I stretch the macro system? How far can I stretch Vim script to do some really crazy things? Even though most people won't actually need to do that, you're always going to have that opportunity to actually explore something new if you do have the inclination to do so. And I don't think this is really special to Vim. A lot of these really featureful applications have this exact same thing. He goes on to say, how can something as simple as text editing require a 3,522 page long documentation? This just isn't right. But the fact is that Vim isn't simple, not by a long shot. And you know what? No, Vim isn't simple. It's definitely not. But neither is Visual Studio Eclipse, the JetBrains Suite, Sublime Text, Visual Studio Code, Emacs. It is harder to specify the length of the documentation for some of these projects. Emacs is much easier because you can just very much get a text form of the documentation, but things like, say, Visual Studio, for example, the documentation is spread out across all of the Microsoft website. But I know I'm sounding like a broken record here. All of this same stuff applies to regular text editors as well. But the thing about the Vim documentation, every single variable, every single key you can press, every single value the variables can have, even how you can combine the different key presses together, all of these things 
are documented inside of the Vim documentation to a really great detail. This is why the Vim documentation is so long. Also, the description of it in page length doesn't really make sense because it's not like the Vim documentation is really optimizing for space. It happily makes use of extra space to make stuff a bit more readable. So even though it might be 3,522 pages long, I feel like you can probably compress that very, very easily. Even though everything is sort of overly explained, this is the preferred result because no one would want to use Vim if it was just as complex as it is right now, but didn't have extensive documentation. There wouldn't be as many plugins that exist. There wouldn't be as many people who say that Vim is just the only text editors you care about. The fact that the documentation is so rich really does help people actually use Vim. Next up, and Vim is perhaps one of the most bloated pieces of software ever created. You have not one way to do a specific thing, but sometimes almost a hundred different ways to achieve the same result. Now, I don't know exactly what the issue is here because you have the macro system, you have regexes, globs, external app calls, this is sort of a natural side effect of all of these things existing in the application. Of course you're going to have hundreds of different ways to do one task. Even just having regex there leads to hundreds of ways to solve one problem. Said and grep are just as bloated if this is the way we're going to define bloat. And that's without even acknowledging the existence of things like plugins, and once you've done that, well, now you have basically an infinite way to do any single task. Then he says a sign or clue to when you've really begun to grok vi, grok I guess is like a boomer word for understand, I don't get it, is when you almost completely stop using visual mode and also stop navigating text in insert mode. Now, this goes all the way back to the start about how you're using Vim the way I don't like you using Vim. I have things at my disposal like visual mode and moving in insert mode, and some of these things do make me far more productive. Sure, your solution, once you work out the regex, might actually solve the problem quicker. But for me, thinking about that regex solution would probably take me like three or four minutes, and in that time, it would be quicker just to go and do it by hand. Sure, if you have like a 10,000 line file, it probably does make way more sense to just go and automate all of that to be done, but when it's something where just doing it by hand and using things like visual mode will just be quicker, in that case, it's just going to be better to do that as the solution. If you always want to do stuff in the quote-unquote Vim way, be my guest. I, I don't really care if that's how you want to work, but for me and for a bunch of other people who do use Vim, that's not the best way to use the application. Overall, I do think this is a really good article that is definitely worth reading yourself, even though it does have a couple of grammatical errors here and there and some spelling mistakes. For example, like every single time he writes grep, he writes it as greb. I don't understand why. Maybe there's a joke there I'm missing, but from my perspective, it just seems like a mistake. I would recommend going and reading this for yourself though, and seeing the rest of the argument being made. If you want to go and host your own blog talking about, I don't know, Vim or something, you can go and do so over on Linode. If it runs on Linux, you can run on Linode. They have the distros you'd expect available, like Ubuntu and Debian, but also Arch and Gentoo because why not? They've got multiple server plans available, so whether you want to host a blog or a personal VPN, you know there's going to be one that fits you. Going forward, I'll be using Linode to host all of my community game nights. If you need help, Linode has 24-7, 365 support available by phone regardless of your plan size. So right now, you guys can get started on Linode with $100 credit by going to the link on screen or in the description down below. Linode was in the game three years before Amazon entered cloud computing, so you know they know their stuff. A huge thank you to Linode for sponsoring the channel. Before I go, I would like to thank my supporters, so a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andre, Nathan, David, Monster, Will, Brennan, Chico Vento, Jamie, Joseph, Mitchell, Peter, the Stephen, Tony, Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support my work, there are links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, star, leave pay, all of that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere, and then this channel is available on Library, Odyssey, and BitChute, if you want to watch my content on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.